2014. Again, I would like to call the City Council Caucus meeting to order for May 28, 2014. If the clerk would read the first item on the agenda. Item number one, under original consideration, an ordinance amending Chapter 248 of the Administrative Code of the City of Schenectady regarding parking large vehicles on city streets. Introduced only with the resolution calling for a public hearing regarding changes to Chapter 248 of the Administrative Code of the City of Schenectady regarding parking large vehicles on city streets. All right, discussed in committee without objection on consent. Item number two. <clears throat> Item number two, an ordinance amending the Administrative Code of the City of Schenectady regarding parking meters. Introduced only with a resolution calling for a public hearing regarding changes to the Administrative Code of the City of Schenectady regarding parking meters. Discussed in committee without objection on consent. Item number three. Item number three, an ordinance amending Administrative Code of the City of Schenectady regarding commercial building inspections. Introduced only with a resolution calling for a public hearing regarding changes to the Administrative Code of the City of Schenectady regarding commercial building inspections. Discussed in committee without objection on consent. Item number four. Item number four, an ordinance amending Chapter 210 of the Administrative Code of the City of Schenectady regarding rental certificates. Introduced only with a resolution calling for a public hearing regarding changes to Chapter 210 of the Administrative Code of the City of Schenectady regarding rental certificates. Again, without objection on consent. Item number five. <clears throat> Item number five, a resolution authorizing the acceptance of the Give 2014 grant. Without objection on consent. Item number six. Item number six, a resolution issuing a negative declaration for the Erie Boulevard and Knott Street intersection construction project. Without objection on consent. Item number seven. Item number seven, a resolution declaring the City of Schenectady to be the lead agency for the Erie Boulevard and Knott Street intersection construction project. Without objection on consent. Item number eight. Item number eight, a resolution authorizing the sale of 954 Albany Street. Discussed in claims without objection on consent. Item number nine. Item number nine, a resolution authorizing the settlement of a tax certiorari brought by Brown. Also discussed in claims without objection on consent. Item number 10. Item number 10, a resolution authorizing the settlement of a tax certiorari brought by Sandham. Also discussed in claims without objection on consent. Item number 11. Item number 11, a resolution authorizing the settlement of a tax certiorari brought by 1707 State Street, LLC. Also discussed in claims without objection on consent. Item number 12. Item number 12, a resolution honoring Elsie Harrington and Lou Grasso as Senior Citizens of the Year. I understand they could not be here tonight, so we'll just put this on the consent agenda. So without objection on consent. Okay. Item number 13. Item number 13, a resolution honoring the service and sacrifice of our nation's men and women in uniform and proclaiming Schenectady as a Purple Heart City. This will be taken out of order. Mr. Kozier will present this. Okay. All right. If, is, there, is there anything else to come before the City Council Caucus meeting? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Ms. Parazzo, seconded by Ms. Porterfield. All in favor? Aye. All right, I will call the City Council meeting to order for May 28, 2014. Uh, we do not have anyone to provide the invocation, so I'm just going to ask that you rise for just a moment of silence. <coughs> All right, I'm going to ask Bill Frank, the director of the Schenectady County Veterans Agency, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, if the clerk would call the roll. Ms. Perrazzo. Present. Ms. Porterfield. Here. Mr. Erickson. Here. Mr. Kozier. Here. Mr. Riggi. Here. Mr. Mutavarin. Present. Ms. King. Present.
Uh, tonight we have another of our economic strengths presentations. Uh, as you may remember, in November, the City Council kicked off an initiative which includes a monthly review of the economic strengths which enrich the City of Schenectady. This review includes presentations by an array of economic contributors, including locally based corporations and industry, area business districts repre representing small and family owned businesses, and other economic sectors from healthcare to service to education and nonprofits. These presentations highlight the economic impact these local businesses or organizations have on Schenectady's economy, including generated income, number of local jobs, innovation and production, along with a review of the history and future planning of the business. Tonight, the City Council is excited to announce we have Austin Fisher and Jennifer Jennings from the Schenectady Green Market to present as part of this series. Schenectady Green Market is a place to find fresh local produce and artisan goods, gather and socialize, and reconnect ourselves with our community and our environment. The market envisions a future in which it is an integral part of downtown's cultural landscape, connecting farm and city in a way that creates a responsible, sustainable food system. Schenectady Green Market is a grassroots organization representing a cross-section of Schenectady, including entrepreneurs, artists, farmers, public officials, activists, and ordinary citizens. Schenectady Green Market brings thousands of people to downtown Schenectady on a weekly basis. Local stores are adding Sunday hours and seeing sales and activity greater than expected. During the summer, vendors donate bushels of fresh produce and other food products to local organizations, including the City Mission and the Regional Food Bank of Northeastern New York. Please join me in welcoming Austin Fisher and Jennifer Jennings, representing the Schenectady Green Market. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Of course, you've now taken most of my presentation away by all of that background information, so it will be shorter than we expected. <laughs> no, thank, thanks again. So we're happy to be here. So a little bit of background information. Apologies for looking at my back, but I can't uh, face two ways at once. Um, so. Uh, the green market started um, over five years ago, 2008, really going into our sixth year. We celebrated our fifth year anniversary last November. Um, very exciting to all of us who were involved right from the, the get-go. Um, a little hard to believe it was that long ago, but things have been going very well. Um, no, uh, no signs of let up. Um, right from the beginning, this was a grassroots organization started by community members just interested in um, in having a, uh, a vibrant, healthy marketplace, um, a farmer's market in town, down Schenectady. Uh, we got together regularly at, um, at the time, at Apostrophes um, over in Proctor's, and um, before you know it, we had, uh, we had started our first market in November. Uh, we're organized as a charitable organization, 501c3. Um, initially, we got some seed money, uh, startup money from uh, both Metroplex, uh, as well as uh, a very generous donation from one of our board members. Um, and to date, that's the only funding we've received. Um, we've been self-sufficient um, from that time on, and we're, we're quite, quite pleased with that. So um, I'm going to read the mission statement one more time, uh, which, uh, um, which we've just heard. I'll, I'll give it one more go. Um, uh, I shouldn't have it memorized, but I don't. Um, so, the Schenectady Green Market is a place to find fresh local produce and artisan goods, gather and socialize and reconnect ourselves um, with our community um, and our environment. We envision a future in which Schenectady uh, Green Market is an integral part of downtown's cultural landscape, connecting farm and city in a way that creates a responsible, sustainable and food system. So that's our goal, that's our vision. Every organization has a mission, that was ours. Um, when I put this together, it occurred to me that we had said we envisioned that future. I, I truly believe that we've actually accomplished that now, that that is a reality, so I think uh, we're pleased to have accomplished that, but, um, but it's an ongoing effort, so we'll, we'll continue at it. So what do we do? How do we accomplish that mission? Uh, we do that through running a farmer's market. That's what, what uh, you think of first and foremost. We don't consider ourselves just a farmer's market. We think we're a much broader organization, um, but certainly the, the market that we run every Sunday uh, from 10 to 2 year round is the most um, visible piece of what the green market's all about. Um, it's run uh, in the winter inside Proctor's, which runs from six months from November to April, and then outdoors, the outdoor season just began recently, um, is right around City Hall, uh, and that runs from May through October. Um, 
We also have a number of other activities, including three annual events. We, uh, we run, a, uh, um, uh, in coordination with Proctors, a, uh, an outstanding in the arcade event. This is, the, I think, the second year going on the third year. That's uh, become quite successful and popular. We also have an annual garden party and a harvest dinner. Um, all those events are fundraisers as well as um, promotion and, uh, for the organization. Okay, so the things that we, uh, that we do. First of all, um, for those of you who are not as familiar with green markets as, uh, as we are, um, there are different types of green markets. They're not all the same. They have different approaches, different um, requirements, and so on. We're a producer-only market. What that means is you have to make or produce what you sell at the market. You can't bring other people's products and resell them. So we, we want the actual producer of those products to be the ones that you are purchasing from. Uh, that applies mainly to, to farmers, but also to our craftspeople and, and others. Uh, what we have is, is extensive. We have all the standard fare, vegetables, fruits, flowers. Um, we have cheese, wine, beer, crackers, bread. We have a number of prepared food vendors, um, which uh, varies uh, from indoor to outdoor seasons. We have high-end crafts. We have beauty and cleaning products. Um, we also complement all of those saleable products with live music. We have children's activities, educational programs, community programming. Um, and then, among other things, what I personally like most about the market is just a place to sort of gather and meet and socialize. You always see people there. Um, I've never been to the market where I haven't bumped into a number of people I know, and so we, f we feel that's very important. Okay, uh, we also, our goal is to serve the entire community, not a particular uh, sector in any form, whether it's economic or otherwise. Um, so we try and make our, our market as accessible to the entire community. Um, among other things, we accept um, uh, um, electronic uh, benefits, uh, food stamps, um, to encourage uh, those folks to, or at least make the market accessible to those as well. Um, we have been very successful at that. We're, um, uh, our sales over the last several years have increased by 50, 50 plus percent. Uh, we also make a lot of food donations. There's leftover produce at the market, um, and many of our vendors are generous enough to donate that to uh, local organizations. So who are we? Um, that is not me with the chicken on my head. Um, that's one of our vendors. Um, uh, but what, what the green market is made up of, the people that makes this happen, would be a board of directors. Uh, there are roughly 20 of us. That varies over time. We've, we're slowly shrinking the board down because what makes our board a little different than some others is we're not only the board, but we're also the volunteers. We run the market all the time. And in the early days, we did everything. We had no paid staff, and we were, we were the market. Um, uh, we're slowly changing that dynamic with Jennifer coming on board. Uh, we also have a full-time market manager, which, which is Jennifer Jennings right here, started with us about a year ago, and that's working out very well. We're pleased to have that. It gives us a lot more capacity. Uh, we have a lot of vendors. We have about 70 vendors both in both markets, so a total of about 140 vendors over the course of the year. We have a strong volunteer program that's growing, uh, high school students and others. Uh, we have supporters, which I'll mention as well, and of course the customers in the community being a key part of uh, any market. So the partners I mentioned uh, before certainly include the city. Thank you for that. You've been an uh, early supporter, and it's been very much appreciated. The, uh, the DSIC, Downtown Skunky Improvement Corporation, J Street Business Association, Metroplex, the Chamber, uh, the County, the Community College, MVP is a sponsor of ours this year, which we're pleased to have. Proctors is a strong, ongoing partner. Union College is a strong partnership, and there are many others. So again, something we feel very good about is making these connections, working together with these organizations, and, and uh, I think uh, to everyone's satisfaction. So, you know, you think of a farmer's market, and many times you think of, well, these are a bunch of people that like to eat healthy, they want local food, so on and so forth. You don't really think of it as an economic engine. Well, the reality is it is a very, very significant economic engine. So, if I could read my own slides, someone made these bullets a little too small, which would be me. You know, we, we average about 2,500 customers every week. Every Sunday over the course of the year, it varies from indoor to outdoor, about 25 customers. If you do the math, that in the five years we've been in existence, that's over half a million people. These are half a million people, um, many of which, most of which, I would say, would not have come to downtown Schenectady on a Sunday. So this is a big, big number. Uh, we're very pleased to have that. Some relatively conservative estimates on how much revenue that generates, it's about two and a half million dollars. Um, so that's also quite a, quite a substantial figure. Uh, we've also heard that we've been responsible for um, encouraging other businesses and organizations to come to, to downtown Schenectady. Mexican Radio in particular has acknowledged the fact that Schenectady Green Market was a key factor in, in them choosing uh, Schenectady over other locations. 
even though we've only been in existence for five plus years now, uh, not as long as some of the other markets, we've already been voted the second most popular market in the capital district, second to the Troy uh, market, which is a far more established market. So again, quite an accomplishment. Uh, we don't view the other markets as competition, but they are benchmarks that we can work off of. Um, I have a business on J Street. I've been on J Street for a long time. J Street, all the businesses on J Street never used to be open on Sunday. Now all the businesses are open on Sunday. Many of them say it's the best day of the week. So that, again, is a, a striking uh, difference, and that's all attributed to the green market. We're also a business incubator. We have a number of vendors, first-time businesses. It's they, they begin a business, they begin it at the market, selling something, and many of them have gone on to other things. They're selling their products in the co-op. Uh, some of them actually left us because they've become too busy doing other things. Um, uh, the success of the market has really uh, helped them a long way. This, this whole concept of a community build, uh, builder, it's a little, uh, it's a little less tangible um, to quantify, but clearly um, uh, the more you can bind a community together and make people feel good about their community has long-term payoffs for you. So in my opinion, um, if you look dollar for dollar in terms of the, uh, the investment that's been made in terms of public dollars into the Schenectady Green Market, um, I would argue that it's probably one of the most cost-effective um, uh, initiatives that's happened in downtown Schenectady, and there's been many, many good ones um, uh, over the last several years. Um, it's really, uh, I think we've really been able to accomplish a lot, both economically and community building wise. And wrapping up, um, so, you know, what our future plans are, well, we're still working on that, but the, the primary goal is we're going to continue with our same mission, same, same plan. Um, uh, we obviously want to do things better. We're always looking to improve our process. Doesn't mean we're necessarily going to grow. We're not. There is a there is a cap to the size that we uh, that we want to achieve. Um, but we're going to build off of our core mission. We have um, some short-term plans this summer to begin farm tours. Another way to just educate um, folks about uh, uh, um, about local farmers and and products. Um, Internally, we want to ensure that we have long-term sustainability as an organization. So we have to we have to work towards that. We're well on the way there. And our mindset is that we will recognize what other farmers and markets are doing, but our goal is not to, to mirror them. Our our goal is not to uh, is not to follow what they're doing, but really decide what we want to do and possibly lead the way um, to things that uh, have not been done before. And that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think that's one of the real success stories in Schenectady, so I really commend you for all the work you've done on that. Okay, before we move on to our out-of-order resolutions, I just want to make a brief presentation to the mayor. Um, back in April, Schenectady County, uh, the cha Schenectady Chamber, rather, had their Good News Awards luncheon. The mayor was not able to attend, so I attended in his behalf. And we were presented with uh, the Good News Lun Award for the Schenectady Homes Program. So, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to say congratulations. Thank you. I accept that on behalf of uh, the city staff and all the partners that have made that possible, and we continue to grow and try and make uh, home ownership and uh, real estate opportunities uh, more available and uh, get people to realize that there are opportunities here in the city of Schenectady. So, thank you for going on my behalf. There. You're very welcome. Okay, we have one out of order resolution uh, recognizing Purple Heart City. Mr. Kozier. And again, if um, you haven't been following the, the paper, Schenectady County uh, just a couple of weeks ago declared itself a, a Purple Heart County. And Mr. Frank is in the very next office next to me. And I said, boy, how can we get involved and, and again, honor the men and women uh, from the, the, the veteran forces? And um, again, with the acknowledgement, uh, Madam President, may I read a resolution? You, you have the floor. Thank you. If I may, whereas on August 7th, 1782, Commander-in-Chief General George Washington established a badge of military merit, the precursor to the modern-day Purple Heart, for singular, meritorious action, and it's the oldest military decoration in use today. And whereas the citizens of the city of Schenectady have great admiration and the utmost gratitude for the men and women who have selfishly served their country in the armed forces. 
And whereas veterans have paid the high price of freedom by leaving their families and communities and placing themselves in harm's way for the good of all, and their contributions and sacrifices have been vital in maintaining the way of life enjoyed by all Americans. And whereas the citizens of our country have received the Purple Heart Medal as a result of being wounded while engaged in combat with enemy force, construed as a singular, meritorious act of essential service. And whereas the City Council desires to proclaim Schenectady as a Purple Heart City, thereby honoring the service and the sacrifice of our nation's men and women in uniform who have been wounded or killed by the enemy while serving to protect our freedoms. Now therefore be it resolved that the city of Schenectady hereby declares itself a Purple Heart City in recognition of those from our community who are Purple Heart Medal recipients. Madam Chair, I'd like to move this. Yes, is there a second? Mr. Erickson, all in favor? Aye. Yes, congratulations. I'd like to present this to the director, Mr. Bill Frank. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of all of the uh, Schenectady veterans, I'd like to thank the City Council, and I'd just like to introduce uh, a couple of uh, Schenectady uh, County heroes and city hero. I've got uh, Claude Dutcher, who is the commander of the American Legion Schenectady County. Um, we have Tim Walsh, who's the commander of Post 1092 in Iskiuna. We have Kurt Von Macher, who's the commander of Post 1001 in Scotia. And we have a veteran with whom I'm very familiar with, Barath Arjun. And finally, we have the newly, was it appointed or elected? Appointed, right? Appointed um, legislative chairman of the Military Order of Purple Hearts Matt Tully, who is just back from Afghanistan. And I'd like to present uh, Matt with this uh, resolution, and if you'd accept it on behalf of all the Purple Heart recipients in uh, Schenectady, the city of Schenectady. So. Anybody say a few words? Pardon me? Oh, I was just uh, informed that uh, Matt's a Bronze Star recipient too, but so. And, and you know, it doesn't stop here. Uh, as uh, I mentioned, the county uh, took the lead on this. Uh, I've been working with the county legislator, Holly Villano, and uh, Chair Tony Druszynski. We are actually on August 7th of this year. It is National Purple Day, and uh, we are going to have uh, another uh, award, and uh, we're going to have some welcoming signs into Schenectady County, Schenectady City, again, uh, welcoming and again, thanking our men and women of the, uh, the services and uh, the Purple Heart, and of course, we're going to continue to shine City Hall in purple for the month of June, I believe, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor, and again, thank you very much to the men and women in our services. Appreciate it. We have no public hearings tonight, so we will move on to approval of the minutes from May 12, 2014. Ms. Perazzo, seconded by Mr. Mutavarin. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Communications and petitions. Communications presented to the City Council for Wednesday, May 28, 2014. Under official from the Mayor, a list of appointments dated May 28, 2014. Under general, there are none. Under petitions, there are none. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to committee reports. Uh, do we have any committee reports? No? Okay, moving on. We'll go to privileges of the floor related to the legislative agenda. I have two people signed up to speak. The first is Jason Plank. 
Madam President, City Council, Mayor. Uh, last week we had um, the audit, the city audit report uh, brought before. Um, one of the main key things uh, of the audit um, is up for debate of how it was presented, but one item that cannot be up to, uh, up to debate is where the city um, is asking, saying that it complied with all federal contracts. As we know that the federal contracts have not been complied with with affirmative action for both minorities and persons with disabilities. Um, I feel that this is one statement within the audit report that is totally false and that it, that cannot um, be uh, slided one direction or to another. It's either you are in compliance or you're not in compliance, and you're not. Um, I'm hoping that the city council will be able to take a look at this within the audit report um, and the city council members do have the, um, it, this is where the, that you guys have to approve it. And I'm hoping that you guys will be able to have that changed and hopefully we can be able to move this thing forward in a positive direction. Thanks. Thank you. Mary McLean. Good evening. My name is Mary McLean. I live in the city. I am very much opposed to the installation of kiosks in the city. The city attorney told us that the kiosks will be convenient and economical. For whom? If the kiosks are installed, I will have to pay to pick up my mail at the post office every day. So will more than a thousand other people. There are that many or more of rental post office boxes and all those renters will have to, will be affected if the kiosks are installed in the city, not the legislators who will vote on the issue. If I have to pay to pick up my mail as a result of this administration's decision to install kiosks, then I suggest that the mayor pay a rental fee for to park his car outside this building where a space is provided for that purpose. Secondly, kiosks will mean a new line item in the city budget because kiosks will necessitate a rental fee that must be paid every month by the taxpayers. There are 700 meters in the city. Currently, when a meter head breaks, it is fixed with a new part. And now, and no more monies are necessary if the kiosks are put in, the, the, the taxpayers will pay a rental fee. Fix the meters, forget the kiosks. Schenectady doesn't need them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I have no one else signed up, so I'll declare this portion of the meeting closed, and I'll move on to approval of the legislative agenda. And I have a motion to approve the legislative agenda. Mr. Kozier, seconded by Mr. Mutavaran. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And we'll move on to privilege of the floor regarding city business. I have two, four, six, seven people signed up. Uh, the first is Jason Plank. Madam President, City Council, Mayor, um, one of the items um, that will be up for public hearing in two weeks is the uh, rental property for Section 8 vouchers. Um, I'm urging the people to come out and, um, on the public hearing and voice your opinion. Um, also, too, is, is I believe that the information that you guys are going to be posted is on June the 4th. That's next Wednesday. Um, it should be posted a lot earlier than that. Um, it shouldn't be waited until the last minute. Uh, I mean, there's nothing that you guys are going to change. Uh, it's calling for public hearing. So that information should be posted as of now. Um, you're calling for it tonight for the resolution, and it should be brought forward. Um, basically, what it is is that, uh, and I also believe that the city should not, and I'll go in more detail in two weeks when the public hearing, should not be involved in it at all. Um, the other one is, uh, 
we had uh, tax seriarities, um, tax assessments that were done um, as of yesterday. I hope people came out and was able to grieve their properties. Um, the more people that we get to grieve, hopefully the city will eventually will have to con concede and actually have to do a full assessment of the city. It needs to be done. Um, and the last time it was done was in 2010. You should be able to do them every five years. Um, and the way to doing it uh, the next following uh, years is to do 20%, divide the city up every, in 20%. So, um, so that way it uh, reduces the cost and it won't put the manpower, won't uh, help reduce the manpower. So every five years uh, a section will be done. So hopefully that will help you with at least a little bit of, of how to fund this and how to be able to move this thing forward in a positive direction. The other piece was the community development block grants um, that was done two weeks ago in the vote. Uh, two city council members should have never been voted. One of them said that they sat on a board uh, under non for profit law uh, section 725. Um, they are held responsible for any and all actions um, of that board. That's the reason why this state has it. So if that board uh, misses filing its taxes, um, employment taxes because the director fails to do it, it's the board that's going to get fined. It's the board that's going to go to jail. Uh, it's the board that's going to have its wages garnished. Um, so to say that they are not responsible for the grant is totally wrong. Uh, so the advice that they were given, they should have been recused themselves. Um, and it's all over the entire community development block grant. Another board member said, oh, my boss did it. Again, it, it was an indirect piece that person should have been recused themselves from voting because uh, they are indirectly benefiting from that grant. So hopefully we can be able to take a look at these two items. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Barack Arjun. Madam Chair, City Council, Mr. Mayor, good evening. Uh, nice to be here again one more time to remind you of why I'm here. Most of you probably already know that. Uh, my, the last time I was here, I was um, under the impression that somebody will do something, and I'm very thankful for that. I was told today that, that the city council member is looking into the issue of the corner store 865 MX Street. Proper protocol, I, I just was fishing to find out that proper protocol wasn't followed by the uh, property owner who proposed the licensing. And uh, as a result, because some of us weren't even told, or some of us were told, but most of us weren't told, or weren't given a letter by either uh, zoning or from the clerk's office, as a normal procedure would you know, so designate. Anyway, I'm here, just one person. I'm here representing the 50 odd signatures which I had submitted here. Uh, one person can make a change. Everybody keeps telling me that. And I've heard it numerous times. You guys have heard it over your years of experience. And I, it doesn't fall in the category of retreat and failure. I'm here to just point out that this corner store is a negative thing in our area, in A65 M Street. And if you don't believe me, and I hope not, but we have went down this road before and the one that burnt down on M Street. The police department will be bombarded with calls. We don't have any resources anymore. We have need the police officers to fight crime, to fight other problems which you have within the department. So this is an additional burden that we are also going to be looking at. So please, take that into consideration. When the police department is going to be, be called every week, 10, 12 times uh, a, a day, you can add that up into man hours, and we're going to have a lot of burden on the police department. Not to mention the drug usage, the uh, selling of the drugs, vagrancy, comes with littering, that whole area. If you look at Emma Street, please drive it. I know Mr. Riggi does it every now and then. John does when he comes to visit me. Drive Emma Street, please, and you will see the difference. We have homeowners came in there, Northeast Parent and Child Rehab, a brand new house that's going to be open, a ribbon cutting on the 6th, I think, or the 7th, or... Uh, uh, 7th of June, beautiful house, nice family gonna come in there and we're gonna have all this negative feedback in the area. Property owners are threatening to move out. They're gonna, they're gonna devalue the property because they can't sell it. 
they are going to come down with a price and eventually they might abandon it, which is going to cost revenue to the city. Please look at the bigger picture. I'm appealing to you. Please deny the licensing of this convenience store. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sharon Lynn Schmidt. Good evening, Mayor McCarthy, President King, City Council members. My name is Sharon Lynn Schmidt, President of the Mount Pleasant Neighborhood Association. We wish to publicly thank some of the 50 helpers who braved the raindrops on Mount Pleasant Cleanup Day on May 3rd. Special thanks to Fire Chief Ray Senegal and Fireman John Delaraco and Assistant Police Chief Jack Falvo Jr., who filled the pickup with debris. To Jack Falvo Jr. and Henry Smalls, the Bucket Brigade, who delivered sand filled cigarette butt disposal Home Depot pails to Crane Street merchants, to the officers who monitored the work sites, the traffic division for the digital caution sign, thanks to Police Chief Brian Kilcullen, to General Services Floyd Slater and Randy Voris, who stopped to thank us for our work. It was great to have bagged trash picked up on cleanup day. To Bill Mazeka for the big boxes, thanks to Carl Olson. To Councilman Vince Riggi, the early bird, who filled three bags by himself. To Councilwoman Lisa Perrazzo and boyfriend who helped clean up Orchard Park for the graffiti crew, anti-graffiti crew. To Councilman John Mutavarin, the overseer. His daughter, John Prasad, and baseball and cricket volunteers, a big turnout at Grout Park. To City of Schenectady Schools, Pat and Patty Southworth, 10th and Webster Park, Panuma Singh, President of the Guyanese American Association, her daughter, Gin Gittengal Singh, Davika Prasad, Usha Etwar Crew in our John Horton Veterans Park, Steve Weiss, President, Tri-City Cricket Club for Volunteers for Grout Park, Susan DeFore, Retreat, Tennis Courts and Little League Field, the Emily A. Willie Foundation, Ashley, Emily and Crew, Orchard Park, Marianne Ricciardi and Gloria DeBlaze, Home Base, Reverend James Bookout, Mount Pleasant Merchant, Phil Grigsby and volunteers, the advance team for Wallingford Park during their cleanup day. Pat Smith and Donna Foley for drilling rainwater holes and buckets and supervising cleanups. To Pauline Briston and Mark Dabrowski, Flora Romanowski for personally handwriting thank you notes. To our donors, Dunkin' Donuts, Barbara Pantalone, Uptown Beverage, Marty's Hardware, Derek Singh and Stewart Shops, Bethany Pignatella Cornier and the Home Depot, Price Chopper and Hanford Supermarkets, the Daily Gazette for promoting our events, any unnamed who helps. Thank you, everyone. We also want to thank Art Clay and crew for response to pothole reports, and Bill Mazeka, Floyd Slater and crew for response to environmental nuisance reports, and to the Schenectady Fire Department and the Schenectady Police Department for risking their lives for our protection. Thanks to John Mutavarin for nominating me for the honor of a Human Resource Commission Volunteer Award. I'm humbled and I'm challenged to serve the underserved. Thank you. Thank you. Marva Isaacs. Madam President, Mr. Mayor, City Council. On Saturday, we had um, the Electric City Bike Rescue Hamilton Hill neighborhood uh, at the Arts Center. And there was lots of kids. They rescued so many bikes, it was surprising to see these kids come out with all these bikes for them to repair. And they did a wonderful job of it. Next in 834 Emmett Street, the, the Smith's house, it's, um, a halfway house and it's ridiculous those guys sit out there and they need to clean up that place the bush is high like this you can't even see anybody could get hurt between there and it needs to be cleaned up they sit there and they drink and they leave the bottle right there the garbage is there and that place needs to be cleaned up thank you thank you joy hall I got warning all up to all of you. Number one thing, they should let the housing know when they're gonna work on the streets. Let them do for housing, all the housing projects, when they're gonna work or do anything. Let them know because everybody got told off and had to pay. And that's not right. Nobody notified them and told them that they were going to work on the street. Nobody knew. I didn't know. 
And a lot of other people didn't know. And you got a lot of handicapped people and everything else. And it's not right. So I want a law made that the city let the housing of projects know when they're going to work on the street. Because we park over there. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed Haifas. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council President, Council Members. My name is Mohammed Hafiz and I live in Schenectady. I'm here to talk about a casino proposal. Um, a few minutes ago, the gentleman here from the Green Market was, present, was talking about the economic and other impacts of the Green Market. And I cannot believe that the City Council is looking into approving this in such a hurry without seriously looking at the impact on the city and the health and well-being of the City of Schenectady. Studies have shown that a casino inside any city, a waterfront city, I mean a waterfront of a city, is a poor use of freshest land and makes no economic sense. A casino would have a devastating impact on local businesses like restaurants, bars, hotels, and theaters. Studies have found that no evidence that most local casinos that at will attract tourist dollars, unlike Las Vegas, most casino goers are locals. There was a gentleman two weeks ago talking about this issue. Governor Cuomo had ordered a study, and they were talking about local casinos attracting just local uh, residents to play, not really the tourists and spending tourist dollars. Uh, they're gambling money, the locals. They're gambling money would otherwise be spent on other options within the city. No serious tour tourist dollars will be generated. <coughs> It would, be, uh, it would be the local who spend their hard-earned money and social security checks. A casino would have serious impact, social impact on the city's residents, including problem gambling, bankruptcies, crime, traffic gridlock, and parking problems. A notable economist have stated that gambling is one of the least productive, productive economic activities imaginable, removing money from one, one uh, set of pockets and putting it into another. Obviously, removing money from the poor, putting it into the richest pockets. Without producing any, any concrete, any, any, uh, anything concrete as part of the uh, equation or the exchange. He also said that statistics concerning uh, casinos throughout the United States show that there are three, in three to five years, almost two jobs are lost for every one job created by the casino. Most places, in, most, most places that introduce gambling see a quick upward spike followed by a steep decline. Also, well, I only have a few, a few minutes, but Warren, Warren uh, let, me, let me quote Warren Buffett. When he, he took to the airwaves, when they, when they uh, proposed casino in his, his home state of Nebraska, he said in 2007, to a large extent, gambling is a tax on ignorance. I find it socially revolting when a government preys on the weakness of citizens rather than helping them. Until we have, I had a longer speech, but I don't have much time. Until we have uh, evidence that uh, a, a riverfront casino would make good economic sense, promote tourism, and would not destroy local business and the social fabric of the city, Schenectady City Council should not vote on the proposed casino. Thank you. Thank you. Mary McLean. I was not able to attend the last city council meeting when the convenience stores item was listed on the agenda. No convenience store should be allowed to operate like the one on the corner of Knott Street and Rand Rankin Avenue. The grounds are filthy, weeds are allowed to grow three feet high, and at this time, a clump of sod was pulled from the ground and has been laying there for the past month. The area is one of the main thoroughfares of the city. It's not a pretty sight. On this other item, I was called on this issue. It has to do with cutting out stars after an American flag 
has been retired. <coughs> I first learned of the practice about a year and a half ago when one of the TV stations did a story on it. I was surprised then and I'm still puzzled by it now. As I understand flag etiquette, cutting up the American flag after it has been retired is still a desecration. Retiring the flag is a solemn ritual, even if it is done by an individual rather than a group such as the Scouts. I give lectures on flag etiquette and distribute pamphlets after the talk. I am taking the liberty to give everyone a copy so that you can understand that retiring a flag is not taken lightly by our government. I asked about the practice last year when I visited West Point. They said they would not do it, neither would I. A citizen has approached this podium several times to draw attention to the practice of cutting out stars from retired flags. Since this forum is being used for such advocacy, I think council should know more about the issue and make a disclaimer on the practice. When flags are retired properly, there are only ashes left and the ashes are buried. Thank you. Thank you. I have no one else signed up for privileges of floor regarding city business, so I declare that portion of the meeting closed and we'll move to miscellaneous business of the council. Mr. Erickson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just wanted to make a, a comment. Uh, Mr. Hafiz uh, came up and talked about the casino uh, discussion, and I think, uh, you know, uh, myself, I've been uh, contacted by quite a few people uh, via email, stopping in the street, asking questions. Uh, people are either opposed to it, they love it. So there's quite a bit of conversation that's been going on, at least from my perspective, in terms of the casino, and I think it's a pretty big uh, decision that we have to make. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the thoughts that I had going forward. I know we'll have a public hearing, and I think that uh, on this topic, more discussion is, is, uh, is warranted, and I think it's important that we do it. Um, you know, with something like a casino, I think some of the points that uh, Mr. Hefes uh, brought up in terms of uh, the risks involved, whether it's uh, you know, crime or gambling addiction, uh, those are definitely things we need to, to think about and, and should be concerned with as a community and, and the impact it has. Uh, on the pros side, there's a lot of dollars that are, are being put out there to say, hey, here's an incentive. And uh, you know, one of the numbers that we were told was about $6 million in city revenue uh, just in uh, gambling revenue of, of sorts that would come from the state. And when I think of that, I said that's, that's a big chunk of money. Uh, if that was applied to tax levy reduction, that could cut city taxes by uh, somewhere about 18% or so, give or take. And I think that's pretty significant. Uh, the city of Sar or Saratoga County has some of the lowest taxes in the area because they use their, their revenue from their gambling quite wisely. And uh, I, I see how, in times, you know, it's pretty easy for government to make six million dollars disappear relatively quickly, uh, with with not maybe uh, six million dollars worth of impact that the, the residents would feel. So, um, I think that anything we do, if we consider this, and, and at this point I haven't made a decision. I'm still kind of weighing those pros and cons. We need to make sure that we have uh, something in place that would assure that we're using the revenue in a responsible way. And, and if it goes into the general fund, uh, I might be disappointed that it might just kind of dissolve and, and, and be spent in, in areas that maybe we don't feel are uh, you know, most appropriate, you know, but each of us. Um, uh, other thought I had is the county is also on par to receive this similar amount of money, $6 billion uh, is this estimate. And, and again, uh, I don't know if this is a high estimate, a low estimate, uh, whose estimate this is, but uh, we'll, we'll 
and I think we need to understand where that estimate came from. Um, the county uh, is on, on part to get the same amount of money. Uh, however, a lot of the risk is born in the city, right? So if, if there's a downside, we're sure to receive it, whether it's uh, traffic issues, whether it's crime issues, um, infrastructure requirements. Uh, those are things that city taxpayers would bear, yet half the revenue of this would go to the county. Um, so I'd like to see how the county intends to, to sh spend their share of this and if some of that would be uh, spent uh, investing in the city or if it would be spent investing in the towns and how that money would be spent, something I'd, I'd want to know more about. Uh, sales tax, uh, we had, we, according to our new agreement, we have sharing of sales tax and there would be quite a bit of sales tax, although I don't necessarily have an estimate at this point um, how much sales tax would be brought in uh, from uh, the casino program. Uh, but the sharing agreement that we have with the county, I uh, believe, is the county would get a majority of the increase. Right now, if, uh, I think the city gets maybe 15% of the total take uh, on sales tax. Uh, it would be shared equitably. Uh, but since 100% of the revenue of this casino would be generated in the city, we would get a minority share of that. And again, the county would, would receive a, a majority share of that. Uh, so I would like to think that we might get some type of a rider uh, addendum to that agreement that would allow the city to kind of take on a bigger share uh, of, uh, of the sales tax gain if, if that was to be uh, considered. Um, and uh, property taxes is another kind of incentive that's been put out there with the growth in, of property taxes. I think that uh, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent uh, and being assessed at full value is, is a Again, another great opportunity for city residents to um, help fund and, and potentially fund the programs we want or lower the taxes. But my concern would be uh, tax grievances down the road and if that, that dollar amount would lower uh, as the years went by. So, so those are some of the concerns I'd want to make sure that we have an opportunity here that if we did it right, we could make a huge impact to the community uh, with a, something like this. But if we didn't plan wisely, then it could be squandered. And so um, at this point, those are the pros, the dollars, generally where I focus on, on some of my things that I think about uh, in terms of taxpayers. Um, so things that we still need to figure out. You know, where is the money? How much is it? What kind of estimates do we have? How do we spend it? Uh, what do we do with it? And, and I think. Uh, it would be important if we do consider something like this that the money does go back to the taxpayer and providing relief. Um, so uh, at this point I haven't made a decision, um, but those are some of the thoughts I had and I just wanted to make them public uh, so people at least knew that we weren't <coughs> discussing it one week and voting on it the week after and gee that was quick. This has been something we've been thinking about for quite a while. Uh, I met with the operators, uh, the proposed operators of the casino, uh, I think it was last week they were in town. So I did have a chance to meet with them. Seemed like very professional individuals. Um, you know, I think they run a. Seem, you know, my impression is that they would run a very nice, you know, good operation, good businessmen uh, who are tied well with the community, and they talked a lot about uh, their involvement in sponsoring different events and stuff. So I think, uh, in terms of partners, they seem like reasonable partners. Um, but again, how legislatively do we handle uh, uh, the upside would be really my concern. So uh, I welcome more input. I've had a lot of people telling me their opinions and, and really I'm, I'm basing my final decision uh, when it comes time on the input of, of the community. So thank you for the time. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Riggi. <laughs> okay, Mr. Kozier. Yes. I yield the time. We're yielding time. We're, we're getting along here tonight, so leave us alone, will you? Um, again, thank you very much. I just want to, uh, uh, again, on, on uh, item number 12, where we had a resolution uh, honoring two of our seniors, Elsie uh, Harrington and Lou Grasso. Um, unfortunately, neither one of the two can be here the, this uh, evening. Uh, they were both nominees and actually winners from the Schenectady County Senior and Long-Term Services uh, Care uh, Program. And uh, Carla, I didn't realize you were one of the board members there. I just saw that on the program here. So, uh, and, well, I hope that maybe. 
But uh, again, Miss Miss Harrington was uh, one of our winners, and she is actually a resident of uh, Kingsway. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, the young lady is 103 years old, and uh, so I guess she does have some reason uh, not to be here this evening. But she certainly extends her best. Uh, they had a nice ceremony uh, at the uh, the church just a couple of weeks ago, and she was there and honored. Uh, so we certainly congratulate her. But uh, the the biggest uh, news is uh, we uh, of all the the county recipients, we actually had two of them who won statewide recognition. And uh, the first one uh, won from the New York uh, Office of Aging. He won the Senior Award, and he's uh, from Rotterdam, New York, and it's Richard Dickershad. He was the Senior of the Year. And believe it or not, our good friend uh, from Woodlawn, uh, Mr. Lou Grasso, was also recognized as a Senior of the Year for Outstanding Contribution. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, they were recognized at the Capitol with the Governor and all our Assemblymen and Senators uh, with them. Uh, and it was just a wonderful uh, luncheon that they had all together. And, uh, um, believe it or not, Mr. Grasso, who is not 103 yet, uh, but just an outstanding uh, individual, is at two meetings tonight, one for the Woodlawn Preserve and the other for the Woodlawn Park. So I certainly think it's a, it's a great excuse for him not to be here. And we're going to recognize him at our Woodlawn Neighbor Association meeting on uh, June 11th. So thank you very much for, for the two resolutions, uh, for those great folks. Um, Prior to me coming here today, uh, I snuck over to the high school, and of course it's uh, the time of the year where uh, all the schools throughout the, the county are, are recognizing uh, the young men and women, uh, the juniors and seniors, and uh, we had a, an opportunity uh, this evening, the Woodlawn Neighbor Association, again in partnership with the Scanty Fire Department, uh, we uh, presented a $1,500 scholarship to a young lady uh, who is a senior at Schenectady High School who was wishing to pursue a career as an EMT, and uh, the auditorium was just packed with students. Uh, um, the diversity, again, second to none. Uh, just very proud of uh, all the young men and women who were there. And uh, again, to uh, all our graduates uh, that will be coming up in June, uh, we just want to congratulate them as well. And uh, finally, just a reminder uh, that uh, Union's annual You Care Day is this Sunday. It's a wonderful event uh, that's sponsored uh, by the Union College students. And it's this Sunday, uh, June 1st, from uh, 12 to 3 at the Fieldhouse uh, on their campus. And it's a free carnival for the kids and families. Everybody's welcome. They have uh, pizza and ice cream, cotton candy, the bouncy house, and uh, games and activities. And they also do tours of the campus facilities as well. So it's a, just another great partnership uh, that we have with our uh, uh, college here uh, in Schenectady City. And uh, we want to thank the Union College students in advance uh, of Sunday's event. So again, it's free to all. And again, uh, from uh, 12 to 3 this Sunday. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Riggy. Thank you, Mr. Kosher. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak. Um, nice presentation by the Green Market, very nice, and it really shows you how something can take off uh, and, and really do a job and, and improve our downtown, improve Schenectady. And if you want fresh vegetables or fresh cheese or fresh wine, it's the place to go. And with that, a good segue on June 12th, the Bellevue Farmers Market is gonna open for its third season. They'll be at the corner of Thompson and Broadway. Uh, and and it's, it's built picking up steam also, which is a good thing. It's, it'll be at four o'clock, and the Commissioner of Agriculture and Markets, Richard Ball, will be cutting the ribbon to begin the 2014 season. So I uh, invite everyone to, uh, to show up and, and to uh, partake in, in that farmer's market, because it's very nice. Now, Getting down to a little city business. We're involved in a walking challenge, so I've been walking quite a bit. And I'm walking Bellevue. I have to say that the condition of some of our streets in my time in Schenectady and as a driver in Schenectady, which is over 50 years, for this late in the season, I haven't seen some of the streets in, in as horrible condition as they are, and I don't really understand why. I call in the problems regularly, but walking, I really get to see it. And the, the area that I walk, the two and a half miles or so, um, in the morning, it seems like the side streets where they're going into the main streets seem to be the worst. Third Street at Campbell is awful. There's huge holes there. Hegeman at Broadway, where the Broadway lunch is, horrible. Arthur Street at Broadway, horrible. Thompson Street at Broadway, horrible. Eleanor Street, Cherry and Cedar, there's ruts in there and holes in there, you don't want to hit it. 
Rose Street, we had a complaint and somebody sent a, an email and I went to check it out. It's terrible. I myself, with my wife's car, I broke the sway bar on her car, hitting one down by the DSS. One that's been filled and dropped. Tony Benone brought it up a couple times while I whacked it, broke the sway bar. I will not be filing a claim with the city. I bought the part and fixed it myself, but that's because I have the ability to do that. It's probably about a $400 job. I don't know what's happening, and I was the first one to defend the city. We had a horrible winter, and the plants weren't open yet. The plants have been open a long time. We're almost to the first week in June, and I don't know what's going on. I know one thing, if you don't maintain something, it's gonna get worse, that I know. No matter what you have, I had to maintain my boiler yesterday since we're in the off season. If I didn't maintain it, I'm going to lose it. We're going to make the streets worse. We're going to have to mill down and do every street eventually if we don't attend to these now because more water migrates into these huge holes. I'm not understand what's going on. Mayor, I'll be happy to ride around with you and we'll, we can triage some of these holes that are in the streets. It's just beyond comprehension to me that we're this far into the su summer or spring, almost into summer, a month away from summer, and the streets are still in this condition. I know Carl Olson said that we should drive slower. We're trying to drive slow, but to navigate, we're going to get pulled over for drunken driving because you have to weave in and out. I'm glad to see Millard Street is finally milled down. That's going to be fixed. But Co Congress Street, pull up to Cutler Street, the first three blocks up to Third, Third Avenue, it's horrible, just horrible. I don't know what's going on, but I'd like to see something done about it. That's for sure. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, but I'm walking over every day the same holes. They're not disappearing. I can't believe no other city people are seeing this. So I plead that we can get these things taken care of. I'll plead to you. I'll be happy to, to take a tour with you, Mayor, and uh, maybe we can identify some of these and triage them some of the worst so they can get at least get filled with, with hot patch because that's what's needed. So that's my thing for this week, and I hope uh, we can get some action on it before there's a lot more damage done to people's cars and a lot more damage done to our streets because it's not good to leave those holes open. I don't care if it's your driveway or what it is. If you leave it open, more water gets in, and it's just going to get worse, and it's going to cost us more. Thank you. Right, Mr. Mutavarin. Thank you. Just an announcement. Uh, the Mount Pleasant Neighborhood Association uh, monthly meeting is Thursday, June 12th at 7 p.m. at the Faith Deliverance Tabernacle Church at 1028 Ostrander Place. And guest speaker is Ms. Melinda um, McFarland, Executive Director, Community Loan Fund. And the topic to be discussed there is community-based economic development in your neighborhood. And I encourage everyone to attend this forum. It's very important that we're having this um, Community Loan Fund and the Executive Director at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, yes, Mr. Regev, it's a bad season. They are working through it in a methodical fashion, doing it on a uh, systematic and zone basis. If you have specific problems that you think we should address, uh, let me know or let Carl Olson know in the batch plant uh, in the batch plant, uh, did have a problem getting the one in Water Elite was open earliest, and then the other ones have just opened more recently. So we appreciate people's patience and are trying to do it uh, again as fast as we can. Have started to work crews on overtime uh, to get it done uh, again as quickly and as efficiently as we can. Wanted to welcome back uh, Phantom of the Opera, which opens uh, tonight at uh, Proctor's which was the first Broadway touring show which came to Schenectady when the expanded uh, uh, stage was in the theater and uh, really was uh, instrumental in terms of being an anchor for the turnaround in downtown. Uh, also, I wanted to just uh, tell the council that today we started partnering with IMS. It's uh, immediate mailing services in the industry for the disabled where we uh, send out our pre-sorted mail or send out our first class mail we get pre-sorted rates and it saves the city roughly four percent on our uh, first class letters and wanted to uh, just congratulate the school district uh, the uh, weekend saw the article uh, in the paper where uh, the attendance record 
has dramatically improved. And you know, I think we have to uh, compliment Larry Spring and the team that he has in place uh, for uh, uh, such a dramatic improvement. Because I think that will show up down the road in terms of graduation rate and it uh, helps change the image of that school district, which is really such a key factor in terms of uh, marketing this community. You know, we've got the uh, Holmes Award where uh, Council President King had gone for it, but it's, uh, again, it's a, uh, a partnership with the city, the county, and the school district to, uh, again, make Schenectady a, a better place to uh, live, work, and uh, own a home. And, uh, Thank you, Madam President. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to congratulate our city engineer, Chris Wallen. Um, he sent me an email not too long ago saying that he was informed by the president of the Capital District Chapter of the New York State Society of Professional Engineers that he has been selected as Engineer of the Year, which is a very nice compliment. Apparently, he was nominated by someone in Santa Barbara. And, uh, that's, I think that's really great. I also had a chance to attend the conference this afternoon, or to this, well, this morning and this afternoon, uh, on behalf of the mayor, by, it was put on by Northern Rivers Family Services, and Mr. Kozier was there also, um, which was a, you know, it's a combination of what Parsons and Northeast Parent and Child have done with their kind of, I guess, you don't know whether you call it a merger or a partnership, you know, but, um, and it was really addressing kind of some of the issues in terms of funding for social service agencies and all of that, and that, you know, times are changing, and the organizations and agencies need to start being a lot more creative. And I kind of came away with some ideas that I think we may want to talk about regarding the community development block grant pro pro project progress um, in terms of, you know, really finding ways to encourage organizations to either work more closely together to show how they're partnering with other organizations and doing things and encourage them to be a little more creative in, in the way they approach their funding requests. So I'll be bringing that to a committee agenda in the not too distant future. Um, with that, I will attend, and, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Kosher, Mr. second by Mr. Rigge, all in favor? We are adjourned. <laughs>